In the show, Bloodraven showed Bran the event in which the Night King was created. So clearly, the Night King's origin story is important, which begs the question, who is the Night King? We got three clues in Season 8, Episode 1, and several more clues in Episode 2. One of those clues from Episode 2, a single word, it confirms the Night King's identity. I'll save that for the end, but here we go. The first four words of George R. R. Martin's first book are, we should start back. And Sam said this in episode two. Think back to where we started. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to start at the beginning, at birth. Jon Snow was an egg, an Aegon Targaryen. And that egg hatched in the crypts of Winterfell in episode one. So the crypts are still playing a role, and they will likely continue to do so. A very important role. That little girl from episode two, she's heading down there now. And if that little girl is Melisandre, it strengthens this hypothesis. So you're probably wondering, why might that girl be Melisandre? Well, Melisandre's really old, but she uses glamour to make herself look like other people. In the books, she glamours herself to look like Egret at one point when trying to seduce Jon Snow. And she usually glamours herself to look like this, Sexy Mel, which may just be a younger version of herself. But Sexy Mel was banished from the North for killing Shireen. So if Melisandre shows back up, which you'd expect, then she's going to show up wearing glamour so that John and Davos don't recognize her. As Phil H. pointed out in a live chat the other night, how cool would it be if this little girl is just a young version of Melisandre? This may be exactly how she looked when her name was Melanie, when she was around the same age as Shireen, back when she was bought and sold as a slave to the Red Temple, Lot 7, probably up at Hardhome. Good call, Phil. That'd be gnarly. So, this new little girl. She's a young girl, similar in age to Shireen. She has a scarred face like Shireen, and she's a random character showing up and having a scene with Davos, which further connects this little girl to both Shireen and Melisandre. The icing on the cake is that this girl's scar comes from a burn instead of grayscale. A burn like Sandor has on his face. In Season 7, Tormund referred to Sandor as being kissed by fire. So that little burn may simultaneously be a nod to Shireen, having a scar on her face, as well as a nod to the Red Woman, kissed by fire. Who knew it to be so? Melisandre's a poet, and she's singing a pretty cool song right now. But the point is, an egg hatched down in the crypts in episode 1, Jon Snow, egg on Targaryen, and Melisandre wants to go down there, based on this conversation in episode 2. And Melisandre must have a reason to go down there, right? All of this suggests that the Winterfell Crypts do have a role to play, a very important role. We'll get back to this. The next clue we're going to look at relates to a little scene in the courtyard. So with just six episodes left, even the smallest line might mean something, or even the smallest line probably means something. The car stocks. One of the better sigils. Why would they waste time with him saying that? They didn't. That line actually has a hidden meaning, a clue. As my friend the little kitty pointed out, The Karstark sigil is a sun. Bran claimed that the Night King wants an endless night, and an endless night is a world without a sun. And last, Jon asked how much time they have, to which Tormund responded, before the sun comes up. So, the word sun is popping up a lot in the first two episodes of Season 8, which brings us back to that huge clue from Season 6, when Gilly pointed out that C and C, they're spelt differently, but they sound the same. The payoff to that clue is the word sun. Sun and sun. Spelled differently, but they sound the same. The word sun is crucial right now to prophecy, specifically the Azor High prophecy. So, there's a very special sun out there. And I'm not talking about Jon Snow. There's another one. Let's find that other special sun. Pun intended. The beginning of the end starts with Jenny of Oldstones and Prince Duncan Targaryen. You know that beautiful song that Daniel Portman slayed in episode 2? That was Jenny's song. There are two takeaways from that song. First, Jenny's friend was a woods witch, the ghost of High Heart. The ghost of High Heart prophesied that the prince who was promised, Jon Snow, that he'd come from the line of Rayla and Aerys Targaryen. That's cool, but for the sake of the Night King's identity, it's small beans. The second takeaway from Jenny of Old Stones is the big one. The clue is her song, but not the song that Podrick sang. Her life song. Her life story, her life choices, and the choices made by those around her. Her husband, Prince Duncan Targaryen, he was heir to the Iron Throne. But just like his father and his siblings, Prince Duncan chose love. 
He chose Jenny even though he was already betrothed to Lionel Baratheon's daughter. Lionel Baratheon, aka the Laughing Storm, he did not find this very funny because his daughter, she was supposed to be the queen someday. So Lionel freaked out. He renounced his allegiance to the Iron Throne and he crowned himself Storm King. Robert Baratheon's great-grandfather crowned himself king. But the main point here is that Prince Duncan loved Jenny of Oldstone so much he cast aside a crown and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. Does this remind you of anyone? Rhaegar and Lyanna, the two lovebirds who found love in a hopeless place. Rhaegar helped Lyanna escape her betrothal, just like Sam helped Gilly escape her husband, her father husband. It's a reoccurring concept, the stealing of a flower. Jenny wore flowers in her hair. Lyanna died with blue Winterfell rose petals in her hands. Gilly is the Gilly flower, and of course, this leads us right into Bale the Bard and the Rose of Winterfell. Check out the link above for the full story, but Bale the Bard quote-unquote stole the Stark girl, the Rose of Winterfell. At least, he stole her heart. Unfortunately, unlike Jenny, Gilly, and Lyanna, the Rose of Winterfell did not escape. But she did have a child. A child that was born in the crypts of Winterfell. And keep in mind, we're looking for a special son right now. That son seems pretty special. The Song of Bale the Bard and the Rose of Winterfell, it's sung both north and south of the Wall. North of the Wall, the Free Folk sing of Bale as a lover, but south of the Wall, people sing of Bale as a murderer, robber, and raper, just like Rhaegar. So the song exists everywhere, both north and south of the Wall. But the Winterfell Chronicles do not include the story of Bale the Bard. That is really shady. Why is it missing from the Winterfell Chronicles? As Maester Yandel said, maybe Bale never existed, or maybe the old Chronicles of Winterfell say nothing of him due to the defeats and humiliations that he was said to have visited upon the Starks. My bet is on the latter. The Starks erased his history, and thus, they erased the history of his bastard child, his son. This ties into what Bran said about the Night King. Bran claimed that the Night King wants to erase this world and its memories, and he might be right. Because if the Night King is that bastard, the bastard born in the Crypt of Winterfell, then the Starks did just that to him. They erased his history. Nowadays, the characters think of him as death, right? Bran said that the Night King wants an endless night, and an endless night is a world without a sun. How much time do they have? According to Tormund, before the sun comes up. Both of those lines take on entirely new meanings if you replace sun with sun. Characters think of him as death, right? That's what death is, isn't it? Forgetting. No, not forgetting, but you're close. Being forgotten. Boom. The forgotten sun. But it gets a lot darker than this. Tomorrow's the elephant in the room. What does the North remember? Catch on the flip side.